Jack, what's going on? Thanks for joining me on the uh, the Order of Man podcast once again. Dude, I am so fired up to be talking to you. We don't get to, to talk often enough, but I do follow your your uh, your moves and your exploits and everything you have going on on the social channels. So I feel like we talk more than we actually do, but thank you so yeah, much for having me on. It is, it is interesting that we can be so connected on social media, so disconnected yet so connected, right? And then oh, when you thing. see an old friend, um, it feels like you can pick up where where it left off. So it's a good thing. Yeah, exactly. It's not like, hey, what have you been doing for the last three months? Because you've been following along and seeing where they've been going, who they've been talking to, like all sorts of different things, what they've been thinking about. So it's uh, it's a very, it's interesting, but it's an odd animal in so many respects. It really and, is. Uh, one that I'm still very new to, as you know, with yes. uh, having no background in it uh, prior to jumping in with both feet, I guess, uh, when the first book launched. But it's a, it's a very interesting uh, animal with uh, yeah. a lot of different dynamics out there. So it's, uh, but it's, uh, but it's good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's working out. Well, you seem like you've immersed yourself well in, in the world of social media. Uh, what do you attribute a lot of that success to? You know, I think it is that I didn't have a background in it, that I kept it not only at arm's length, I just never even really thought about it. You know, it was a, uh, I didn't know the difference between a, a friend and a, a like and a post and a tweet. You know, it was just all this thing that other people did that I did not want to do. I had no interest in, didn't have any time for. And when I was in the military, you know, as you know, you have to be focused on that mission and you're focused on the guys as a, uh, as a leader. So you owe them and their families and the mission and the country. Uh, but I, so I never paid any attention to the social media stuff, plus the security aspects. And it didn't seem at that time that, uh, it, it wouldn't do any good <laughs> to have any sort of a social media presence. Now it's a little different. Now, if you come in and you've grown up with social media, you've grown up sharing or oversharing. That's how you communicate with friends. And now if you're on, let's say the, the darker side of special operations or in intelligence circles, and you don't have a social media profile that you can, someone can go back and look at and see your history, then you're the outlier. So it's a very interesting thing when you're looking at it, when you're kind of red selling it from the enemy's perspective. Um, it's a whole whole new world. Plus, you throw in some facial recognition technology into all of that. And uh, these are all things I'm going to explore in future novels. But um, you asked about the, how I've been dealing with social media. And I think it's because um, I didn't have that background. I didn't have anything to fall back on like, oh, this is how we did it at my last job. Or this is, uh, this is how you always do it. Or this is just what's done in the space. Like, I had no idea. You know, I didn't even know the, what the word space meant. You know, I thought it meant a compartment on a ship or something. Right. Um, and uh, so I just jumped in, looked at it as I would a problem on the battlefield or an opportunity on the battlefield. And I uh, just looked at it without any, uh, t without a tainted lens. It was just a clear lens looking at it. Hey, here's an opportunity to connect with people. Uh, how do I do it in a positive way? I don't know how to be anybody but myself anyway, but just how do I maximize this opportunity to connect with readers and uh, you know, build this readership and build this following for the, for the novels and maybe connect with people in a positive way um, as I go. So I think that's why it's been, or people tell me anyway, that it's, uh, that it's been successful. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you're doing it right, but you know, like any tool, you can use it effectively, which it seems like you have, or you can use it to, uh, as a negative, right? Something to draw you down, something to uh, allow a lot of toxicity or negativity into your circle and into your life. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is so many people consume themselves with it. Uh, to the point where they can't maintain focus on the mission or the task at hand, and it becomes a real detriment rather than the powerful tool that it can be. Sure, sure. It's a tool, and it's very important to recognize that, I think, and especially talk to kids about it uh, and talk to kids about, hey, this is, a, this is a tool. Essentially, it's an advertising platform, whether you have a business or not. And that's how I frame it to the kids, especially our daughter, who is uh, 14 now. Um, and I say, hey, even if it's a personal account of a friend or a personal account of a friend's family, that's an advertisement for that family. They're not showing you what's going really going on behind those doors, which is probably chaos like everybody else. Um, but they're taking a one snapshot to advertise something. Yeah. And in the case of a personal account, it's a, a lifestyle uh, that, or an attitude um, that, uh, that they want to project to the world, that one split second out of the entire day. So I, I try to frame it as, uh, hey, this is an advertisement, whether it's a business 
or not. Um, but you're right, you can use it positive, negative. And what really surprises me I, is how many people are so negative on, oh, uh, on social media. And I see you post about it. I think you did one yesterday that I really, uh, that I really liked. Um, but I see you post about it um, because you're very outspoken in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and so people can, can latch on. And uh, for me, it's, you know, I talk, you know, I talk about a lot of books. I go back talk about terrorism, talk about my thoughts around different events that, uh, that impacted me and the novels and things like that. Take people on this journey, a very transparent journey into the world of publishing and writing. Um, but there, even in that, there are people that jump on and say negative and sometimes crazy things. And I just, oh, just block wow. feature, oh. <laughs> block, yeah. you know, delete, block. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of that feature. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I would never jump on someone's account or, uh, you know, you talk about negative reviews, like negative reviews for novels and things like that. Luckily, you know, my books don't have many, but there are a few out there. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yeah. and it's fascinating, like how many people would take that time <laughs> So be so negative. Um, it's, it's really astounding. Like I would never do that. If I didn't like something, I just you know, wouldn't leave a review. Or I would right. say something. Exactly. Well, that's uh, because you're successful. <laughs> well, I was going to say that's because you're successful, but actually I don't know if that's the case. I think that's one indicator that you probably are successful, right? That you're not so consumed with what you don't like or nitpicking things that are blown out of proportion or taken out of context uh, it's absolutely ridiculous what some people do. It's unfortunate. You know, the more I, the more that I'm on social media, the more I just want a podcast and that's it. Right. No, I get <laughs> we, it. We I can have it. conversations with people we like. In fact, I even had a conversation with a guy. We had a great civil discussion about um, some conservation efforts. He's not a hunter. He's not opposed to certain types of hunting, but he's not a hunter himself. And we had a very respectful, civil conversation about something that seems to be so polarizing on social media and just creates this black hole of negativity and animosity and polarization. It's crazy. Right. No. And I, you know, so I choose, you probably notice I choose not to show certain parts of the hunt because sure. once again, that snapshot of someone's, you know, positive day when they're all done up and they have the filters on and then, you know, your, your teenage kid is looking at it and saying, Oh my gosh, look how either pretty or look at that other family gets to do, or, Oh man, why don't we do that? Or why don't I look like that? Or whatever, whatever it is, it's that same thing. I don't want to show that one snapshot of the hunt that doesn't really capture what goes into it, what goes into yeah. that preparation, what goes into that adventure, what you're doing it, why you're doing it. Um, and so I, so I don't want to essentially give the other side ammunition to, uh, to use against something that is so, uh, near and dear to, to my heart and, uh, something that's very important to our family. And I think very important to, uh, what well, being a good citizen and providing for your family and just understanding, uh, the, how, how, how we live and how, why you're here today. And that's because once, once upon a time you had ancestors that were very good at providing for the family through hunting or for, uh, at defending the tribe. And that's why, and the more we, distance ourselves from that, um, distance ourselves from the earth, um, the more uh, apt people are to make snap judgments based on one tweet or one photo. So I try to be very cognizant of that um, uh, as, as I post and, and try to, I try to be thoughtful. Yeah, no, that's, I, I think that's a good idea. And I think the fact that you said not giving anybody ammunition, right? And that's what they see is they see you. I mean, let, let's be frank, hunting, you are taking the life of an animal period. Like that is, that is the story, right? But if you take it out of context, it sounds brutal. It's, it, it sounds wrong, morally wrong. But when you put it in the context of the preparation and the hunt itself and the care of that animal and the conservation efforts that went into maintaining the lands where these animals could thrive and the humane uh, way we go about harvesting these animals, then it changes the story and, and it gives more context that's important. These aren't trivial matters. That, that, that context of a hunt is very important. You know, it's, it's funny though, we were talking about a, um, a mutual friend before we hit the record button, Andy Stump, and he said something very similar about social media. And he's not really all that active on social media, uh, but he had said something to the effect of, it's hard for him to post, for example, a jump because everybody sees a 17 or a 30 second or a 60 second jump or whatever it ends up being. And, and they never see the context of the days and the week long hikes and the trip and the planning and every other jump in controlled environments leading up to that. And not only do they get a false sense of what it takes, 
it actually paints, in his case, a very dangerous perspective uh, regarding the pursuit that he's he's decided to 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 pursue to go down, uh, and it gives this this unrealistic expectation of of what it takes. It's dangerous. Oh yeah, I've talked to him a lot about that, but uh, it is dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> the other I side mean, of that, it's, it's dangerous you know? with as much preparation as he he has yeah. and done he's and everything. Else, let alone somebody who's an amateur who just thinks, oh, you just throw on a little squirrel suit and jump off the edge of a uh, five thousand foot cliff. Like, that, what's the problem? That couldn't be yeah. too difficult. <laughs> no, he's a pro. He's a pro. He I love that pro. guy. Yeah. Well, I but, think that's uh, uh, one of the things that makes uh, a pro a pro, or you can recognize a pro when things look easy. Uh, and, and you have a tendency to maybe say, oh, he's, he's a natural. Uh, one might say that about you. Oh, he's, he's a natural writer or he's a gifted writer. Uh, that's how we begin to understand that this is somebody who's not maybe necessarily gifted, but they've put in thousands and thousands of hours and effort into mastering a craft. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know the overnight success thing, there, there is really no such thing as an overnight success. Uh, and if you're saying that about somebody, then, uh, you're probably using it as an excuse for why, uh, you're not where you want to be. Yet. Yeah. Good point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that, that part's interesting. So growing up, you know, I read all these novels that, uh, the, the types that I'm writing today. Uh, and I knew from a very early age that one, I was going to serve my country in uniform as a seal and two, I was going to write fiction in this genre. And as you can see behind me on the video, for those that are watching on video, those, that's, uh, it's, it's just part of the library. A lot of those go three deep uh, books. So I need a, need a larger Maybe library. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, but I have those books that I read growing up, all the Tom Clancy's, the David Morrell's, the Nelson DeMille's, the A.J. Quinnell's, the J.C. Pollock's, all these guys in the 80s that typically had protagonists with backgrounds that I wanted to have one day. So back then they were typically in a special forces guy in Vietnam or a CIA guy in Vietnam. They had that. That was the background in the as people as protagonists were developed in the 80s. That was their background that gave them the skills necessary to do what they needed to do in the world of fiction. So with no Internet back then and not being able to Google Navy SEAL and have an unending supply of information, uh, the nonfiction that I could read, I could get through in about an hour back when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. But these novels that had protagonists with these backgrounds, I could dive into those all the time. And my mom was librarians, we're surrounded by books. So really that laid the foundation for me as I was that those guys were my early uh, professors in the art of storytelling. Uh, of course, I knew where I wanted to go. So I was been thinking about it for all those years. And then I add that study, academic study of terrorism, insurgencies, warfare, and then the practical application on the battlefield after 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then as I got out, all those three things, that academic study, the experience in combat, and all those authors I read growing up all really gave me the foundation to move forward and do what I wanted to do next. So I feel very fortunate that, uh, that I developed a love of reading at a very early age and also knew that I, what I wanted to do from an early age as well. Yeah, I think that's a blessing because I, I mean, I can't tell you how many men I talk with on a daily basis who have no idea of what they want to do. And these are 30, 35, 40 year old and sometimes older men who have gone decades without having a clear understanding of what it is that they want to do. So you definitely had that blessing. And, and also, uh, you know, props to your, to your mom for influencing you that way and putting you in that environment. And I think, man, if, if there isn't a better story of what it means to be a parent and how important it is to give your children opportunities, I mean, I, I don't know what is. That's, that's pretty incredible. No, and it's all about, you know, finding that purpose, finding that next mission in life, which is uh, what I tapped into in the, the second novel in, in True Believer. The protagonist needed to find that next mission in life, find that purpose, learn to live again. And I saw so many people leaving the military and my particular slice of that was special operations. And I saw guys have a really hard time making that transition because they'd been involved in something that was, that was so visceral. They had to be so focused on it to essentially the detriment of all else, family, anything else, uh, because that's what we could talk about that's what you owe the mission that's what you owe the guys to your to your right and left right. how many times to come to move on a lot of them want to try to replicate that in the private sector instead of saying and and i, and I recognize that and so i said okay this is one chapter of my life i was a seal i am not a seal going forward that certainly informs my writing it uh it helps help build me into who i am today but i'm not going to live back there um i'm not going to live back there uh, and i'm going to move forward take care of my family with this new purpose, this new mission. And that's taking care of the family and 
doing that through this passion of mine for writing. So uh, I think it's very important for people to, it doesn't have to be military, it can be any transition, but identifying what's important, identifying that next mission in life, finding that passion and that purpose as they move forward. Uh, that's, uh, that is the vital importance. Well, I think uh, one of the takes you just said there too, is that you, you didn't identify with being a Navy SEAL. L- let, me, let me rephrase that. That's maybe not the right word. You didn't wrap up your identity in that thing indefinitely, right? And that's what we fall into. If you ask, if, if we did a little an experiment today and we said, all right, I, I just want you to go out and ask 10 or 20 people to introduce themselves. The first thing those 10 or 20 people would say is they would lead with their occupation. Uh, most of them, if not all of them. Well, I'm a, I'm a writer or I'm a uh, soldier. I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm a owner. I'm a CEO. I'm an entrepreneur, whatever. So we're ro- so wrapped up in the identity of what we do. And then when that thing is taken away from us, either voluntarily or involuntarily, it's really difficult for us to connect back or, or have any sort of congruence in our life or, or fulfillment because the thing that we wrapped ourselves up in is now gone. It's no longer with us. No, exactly. And I think I won't say, you know, so when I was in, of course, I identified as a SEAL. And sure. I identified like that's what I do. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to be a better SEAL each and every day. What do we call it? Earning your trident every day. So for me, that was physically um, and, you know, mentally by studying the enemy, studying warfare, studying insurgency, studying where we were going in the world, uh, why we were going there. Uh, so studying the strategic side of it so that I could then translate it to the guys so that if they had questions about it, hey, why are we here? What? Hey, this is, you know, the, this route Irish is worse this time than it was last time. You know, what the, what are we doing here? Um, so to be able to, to explain that in a way that makes sense, hey, this is our mission. This is why we were here. Uh, and that's what we need to focus on. Um, so so it is important for me to be able to, to study that sort of thing and, uh, and make myself a better leader, combat leader, uh, each and every day. So, um, but as I transitioned, yes, that's where I made the distinction. Like, okay, that is what I did going forward. I do something else. I have a new mission in life. Uh, it's time to pursue that next passion as I turn the page on what I once was. So um, it's always going to be a part of me. Always be obviously in terms of my writing. It's a very big part of who I who I am today. But uh, I am I'm moving forward. I think that's yeah. what's most important. Well, and I think you you alluded to this as well as that it. It, it doesn't completely define you, right? It's, it's, a, it's a part of who you are. And that's, that's all it is. And it will always be there. But it's deeper than that. It's, it, there, there's significantly more if you peel it back. And I think too many people are one-dimensional as opposed to trying to be well-rounded. You see it on social media to come back to that is like these, these entrepreneur types uh, and, and their whole world revolves around starting a business and hacking and growth strategies <laughs> and how hacks. they can capitalize. Yeah, it's, it's just wrapped around that, that whole thing. And it's like, man, where's the time with the family? Where's the time for pursuits that maybe aren't, aren't money or profit driven, but that you just enjoy like archery or hunting or jujitsu or jumping off ledges or whatever your thing is? Like, where is this other stuff? And you ask these guys and it's like, oh yeah, no room for that. You know, I'm hustling, I'm grinding. And I think we face real serious problems when we're so narrowly focused on that one thing that we can't think about what else is happening or what else is going on around us. Yeah. And that's something I need to improve on actually. It's uh, because when I was in the military, um, you know, the, I guess the excuse is that, Hey, you're, you're taking guys downrange. Mm -hmm. So that pendulum has to be on that. It 100% has to be on those guys on the mission um, because that's what you owe them and their families. So, okay. So when I got out and started this, this is very, uh, this is a, an entrepreneurial venture, which I didn't really uh, anticipate or think about as I was getting out or as I was writing the first novel, I thought you just wrote and then you sent it off and then it got published and then you wrote the next one. Mm-hmm. Like, I had no idea that you needed to do branding and co-branding and advertising and marketing and you know, all these other things that uh, the social media stuff or whatever. I had no clue. So I just, but when I realized it, I said, Oh, okay. Now I get what this is. This is also a small business. Just like if you were starting a coffee shop or something else, you have to do all those same things. So mm-hmm. how am I going to do it? I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at the space and I'm going to see how I can do it to the best of my ability, innovate along the way, adapt along the way, just like I would on the battlefield, but look at it with that clear lens. Um, but you know, I did jump in because I have a tendency to do that all in. Um, and so my wife more than a couple of times has had to say, uh, Hey, uh, you're not taking people down range anymore. Um, <laughs> it's time for you to be here present with the family. Um, so I do have to kind of kick myself every now and again and, uh, take a breath 
step back and realize that, hey, oh, if I don't get this thing out on time or if I don't, don't do that, you know what? It's not the end of the world. Uh, guys' lives aren't hanging in the balance. Uh, and I can, I can take a breath. I can spend time with the family. It's different than leading guys into battle. So uh, for me, that's probably been the biggest, biggest challenge is recognizing that, articulating that, and then, uh, then acting on it. Once again, adapting to the changing environment and, uh, and being able to realize that, okay, you know, I can step away from this for a few minutes. I can throw the ball with, uh, with one of our kids. I can go to lacrosse practice. You know, it's not going to, the world's not going to end. No one's going to die if I don't finish this project today or whatever else it is. So right. uh, it's something that I really do have to concentrate on, uh, and be better at, uh, at recognizing and, and doing. I, I don't think that's uncommon for high achieving men. I think that's probably part of the reason they are high achieving men is because they know how to fixate on something and then they know how to attack that thing and go after it and have success. Yeah. We leave a lot of collateral damage in our wake at times. Um, you know, which it would be easy to say that's the price of success, but man, it really is something that we all ought to do a better job considering and then unplugging. I mean, do you feel like you're able to turn it off uh, completely or do you feel like you're always on? It's tough. You know, so I'm sitting like when I'm sitting on the couch and we're watching, finally have the kids to bed, grabbing a glass of wine and we're watching a show or whatever. Um, you know, my mind is kind of thinking also about some of the things I need to do either tomorrow or right before I go to bed, or it's just subconsciously thinking about a problem on the written page. Like before I used to solve problems aggressively on the battlefield. Now I do that on the written page. And as I write the outlines for these things, I don't let a problem or a sticking point stop me. It's just like, okay, kind of XXX in that spot. I know I'm going to have to figure that out. And I know that I will. I know that I have time. It can percolate. And by the time that I get to that point in the story, as I write, I will have figured this out. I am confident mm. in that. Um, but it's subconsciously that's going in the back of my head uh, quite a bit. So, um, so I don't know if I can ever turn it really all the way off, but I can kind of push it to the side and be present um, like I need to be with my family when I need to, to, to be there. So you can manage um, it, it sounds like. I think so. And I think moving forward, I need to get a lot more disciplined in my approach to scheduling. And in, you know, as I started this, it was, it was a startup and I feel like I had to take advantage of emerging opportunities, um, which meant that being disciplined as far as a schedule went was not advantageous. It was not uh, the most efficient way to go because I would be stuck in that schedule like you would be if you were a gigantic bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So when you know, you're a one person startup and you're moving and you're grinding and you're sprinting uh, and you can very easily flex and adapt as these opportunities arise, um, well, that doesn't really play into a schedule of I'm going to get up, I'm going to work out, I'm going to do my three hours, four hours of writing, I'm going to return emails for an hour, I'm going to, you know, so that didn't really work because podcasts pop up, interviews pop up, radio pops up. That's live. Uh, you know, you have to get to put together some sort of a, a, you know, a graphic or whatever else it is. Like those things don't necessarily adhere to your schedule, but as you get more successful, as you like get this foundation built, then it lends itself more to being able to schedule. But I don't think at this stage where it's the startup phase that, uh, that I'm in a position where I can dictate the schedule. I still need to be agile uh, at this stage. So um, that's kind of where I am these days. It's a good point. I mean, a lot of guys talk about this idea of work-life balance, right? And striking the perfect balance. And, you know, some people, I think, believe that balance is having equal distribution of your time, energy, and resources in all of the facets of life that you're showing up. I don't look at it like that. I, I look at it as you know, you're constantly making micro adjustments based on the situation or the circumstances around you. And so this is what you're talking about. There may be times where it's completely appropriate to dive in head first, all in on the writing process because you have to meet a deadline or there's a schedule that needs to be met. And there's times where, you know, we can ease off the, the gas a little bit and we probably ought to spend some more time at lacrosse practice or coaching a kid or, you know, just being home and being present with them. But man, I don't know what it is about men. And, and, and I say men, I'm, I am included in this category is like, it's, it's just hard to uh, be as present sometimes with a family as, as it is at work. And I, and I think it's because we can quantify a lot of work objectives and goals and we can't quantify necessarily being a better father or being a more engaged husband. Those are harder to quantify, which is why we naturally gravitate towards, I just need more money in the bank account, or I need to get more words on the paper, or I need to hit this deadline because they're measurable. They're very objective. Right. 
Exactly. Exactly. But recognizing that I think that for me anyway, that I need to do better at those other things and doing better at them, even though I can't really quantify it other than, Hey, I was there. I was present. I was engaged. Um, does everybody slump? Is everyone happy? <laughs> like, like those things I can, uh, I can look at and I, you know, I don't want my kids to, to look back and, and say, Oh, dad was always in the office or dad yeah. was always working. So I try to you know, keep, uh, like, I'm in here when the kids are at school. Uh, and then as soon as, you know, it, pick up time. I try to be there, try to get them to their activities, be right there at those activities, um, talk to them about their day and not be constantly on my phone. Um, cause that's the mobile office. You know, that's, that's the, it's one, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Actually you don't have to go into an office, but it's also, you're always reachable. Um, always. so, uh, so I, so I, it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a tough, you know, and people say balancing act, but you're right. It, it's, it's that pendulum can, can go different ways at certain times. And sometimes it needs to be on the family. So this number, mm-hmm. you know, we kicked it off and, and, uh, did a, did a river trip with the family where there's no, uh, Wi-Fi, no cell service because you're in the bottom of river Canyon for five days and you have, there, there's no choice. You have to be engaged. There's no, hold on one sec. I just need to return this really important text. No, there's none of that because there's no service. So right. we did that. We hit a, a dude ranch for my dad's birthday. We went to New York for a week. We went to Africa, um, but all with the family. Um, I got the kids to camps and then I went on book tour. So it's, uh, you know, that pendulum was on the family for a lot of the summer. And then it swung back for book tour. Oh my gosh, that was a full on sprint. So it was always on this side. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a swinging pendulum from uh, time to time. But, you know, eventually I think you do get to a place and it's different for everybody where uh, you can take that breath and say, okay, now I'm going to dictate the, right. the schedule. And, and that's different for everybody. You know, for some people it's, uh, you know, it might be right away. They hit that, that level where they're, uh, they're happy, they're content, they're whatever it is. Uh, and then for others, it's going to be of here, you know, so when they hit a certain level and some people have never hit it, you know, they, they, they never take their eye off the ball. Uh, and maybe that is the detriment of their family or maybe not. Maybe their kids see how hard that they worked to achieve what they did. So I don't know. It's a, it's all tough, but, um, but it's a, it's a great journey and you gotta, gotta enjoy it along the way and be the best example you can for your kids and teach them to be self-reliant, teach them to be good citizens. And, uh, really if you're, if you're doing that, I think that's a good foundation. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I like that you say you got to enjoy it along the way. I was, I was on a walk because, but we just bought some property here in Maine and and have plenty of room to walk around every evening. And so I do that with my family about 90% of the evenings. And I was walking and my kids were out in front of me and they were playing in the fields and kind of running around and looking at mushrooms and seeing what animals they could see. They found a big, huge wasp nest just off the, the main tract of land. So they were looking at that. And, uh, you know, I thought to myself, man, how, I feel like I waited too long to make this happen, but the other side of me says, man, I, maybe I couldn't have made it happen earlier, right? So I've been working to get to this point where I am right now, but then I started thinking about me lying on my deathbed and me, me being you know, terminally ill or incapable of, of going on a walk with my family. And I think, man, these are the things that bring me joy and satisfaction. And what a shame it is that so many men are pursuing and chasing things that don't bring them that level of satisfaction. And I'm not saying it needs to be your family or a family. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you need to find whatever it is for you and pursue that deeply and, and with purpose, like you talked about, um, because man, this life is short. It's very, very short. I'm starting to realize that it's crazy how fast time is going. Oh yeah. And there's whatever that thing is, you know, that, uh, seconds tick by faster as you get older, whatever that space time continuum is like, it's a real thing. It does. There's no doubt about it. And they can be gone in a split second as we know from today being a nine 11, um, 18, 18 years since that day. Uh, so all those people that, uh, that showed up to work in the twin towers or got on those, uh, got on those planes 18 years ago today. That was their, that was the last time they uh, were ever with loved ones, the last phone calls they made, the last time they woke up in the, in the bed. So, uh, yeah, you never know what's gonna, what's gonna, what tomorrow is gonna bring, or what the next second is gonna bring. So, I think for you, it's you know, it's great to follow you on on social media, and you're a you know, you're a, you're a great example to other people out there. And for you at this stage in your life, to me anyway, looking from the outside in, uh, seeing the ages that your kids are, and uh, seeing that you made this move at this time, and to me, it looks like the, the perfect time to have done what you did. So, it's very very cool. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. I want to go back to one of the things you said is that there might be some problems on the page that you need to work out. Um, And I think we all run across these problems in various forms. What would be some of the problems 
uh, that you would deal with in the writing process that you feel like you had to work through? Is it just writer's block? Is it motivation? Like, what is it that you're actually dealing with? Yeah. So the actual problems that the characters, uh, for the situations the characters are engaged in. So I've never had writer's block and I probably shouldn't even talk about it because now yeah, we're we an hour when we're, when we we're done. Yeah. You, man. But, uh, but I got that from Stephen Pressfield and Stephen Pressfield, he wrote a few books. Uh, well, he wrote Gates of Fire, Legend of yes. Bagger Vance, the Afghan campaign, you know, a ton of the books. Uh, but I didn't know Bagger wrote, Vance was his book. Yeah, the oh, movie was that. yeah amazing. Yeah, totally different yeah. than a lot of the other things that he's. Well, yeah, he's I mean, done. most of us think about uh, the the War Gates of, of Fire and Gates yeah, of Fire. And, from yeah, fictional so and non fictional, he's got two great works that most people would jump to immediately. Yep, exactly, and that's those works on creativity. That uh, that it's either those ones, uh, the War of Art, Turning Pro, um, yeah, uh, do the work. There's a few of them in there that the Authentic Swing, that are all really about hey, just sit down and do it. Like, do that's it. pretty much what they do all the say. Work. And I don't remember if it was in one of those books or I think he he was on Joe Rogan at least once. I listened to him once, and it was an, an amazing listen. But I think it was on the podcast, but where he said, hey, you don't hear of a trucker getting trucker's block. You don't hear about a dentist getting dentist block. You know, <laughs> you're a writer, sit down, be a professional and write. So for me, it was like, oh, got it. That's easy. Be a professional and write. That's what I do. So I really liked him putting in those, in those terms. <laughs> you don't hear of a trucker getting trucker's block. I like that. So, that uh, makes sense. I, the whole idea of just be professional like that, that just, that strikes me, man, is like just, professionals do it regardless of how they feel because that's what they committed to doing. That, that's, that's what really you do. Good. Yeah, that's what you do. And he, so I got so much from him. I got another, another thing I got from him was he would write the theme of his book as he was writing it on a yellow sticky and put it next to, in his case, I think it was the typewriter. In my case, it was the MacBook sure. and I'd put it there. And so for the first novel, that theme was revenge. And so I wrote revenge on this yellow sticky. I had it right there. And so as I wrote, if something didn't tie back to that theme, either directly or more importantly, indirectly, then I would discard it. So essentially I'm editing as I go, staying on theme. And I think that really helped when it got to New York and got to a professional editor in that they, she had hardly any edits. There was like three content edits. Um, like, would he really say this here? Would he do this here? And a third one, I can't remember. But I mean, I thought they'd change it all up. You know, I'm like, right. well, they want to put exploding robots from outer space in this. Yeah, the that's what you're like, about, Let's do right? it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she had, and it was one of the, you know, the best editor in the business, Emily Bessler, who did uh, Brad Thor, Vince Flynn. Like, she's amazing and uh, had very few edits, but I attribute that to Stephen Pressfield's advice. Mm. Um, but going back to the original question, uh, uh, the problems on the written page, are, it's not writer's block. It's really, okay, at this stage, what would make it sense for the protagonist or one of the supporting characters, how would they handle this problem? So you're in the story, just like you would be in real life, solving a problem outside, whether it's the battlefield or, you know, anything that you're, you're dealing with that you have to think through and solve. So the same thing on the written page, it's, it's now in a fictional narrative and I'm bringing my feelings and emotions behind different events that uh, transpired downrange or uh, in my life into these, applying those to a fictional narrative. But the characters need to problem solve. They need, in some cases, aggressively problem solve. Uh, in some cases, very violently problem solve. And so you got to think through all those dilemmas and have them solve these things in a way that uh, that's, that's creative, that brings in some of, uh, some of my background for the protagonist anyway, um, and keeps the story moving forward in a way that makes sense for the reader. So uh, you're taking the reader on this journey and typically it's a, uh, so I, I, growing up, I, I studied uh, someone named Joseph Campbell and my mom introduced me to him in 1988 when he did a series of interviews with Bill Moyers on PBS about the power of myth and what he did, uh, his seminal works called hero with a thousand faces. And what he did was look at mythologies across culture. And he found that, Hey, the hero's journey is very similar uh, throughout history with different cultures that never had any interaction with one another. And there's typically a reluctant hero that goes on a journey. He faces some sort of adversity, a crucible along the way. He emerges transformed. Typically he meets someone, an older, wiser person that gives him information to pass along to help him uh, uh, overcome this adversity. And then he emerges transformed and typically returns back home transform. So, uh, all of that was very, I was, I was very cognizant of that as I was writing. So I know that, uh, for whatever reason, from the oral tradition of storytelling around the campfire to today's modern movies, I mean, think of any of your favorite movies or books and a lot of them fit 
this hero's journey. It, like think of Star Wars. Most everybody's seen that. So you have sure. Obi Wan, you know, coming in and giving that knowledge. So you have all these different things that fit in. And uh, George Lucas was very influenced by Joseph Campbell's work. Um, so I'm thinking through these problem sets as I'm thinking through this hero's journey. And how does this, how does the protagonist solve these problems as he's moving? How does, what, what crucible is, what's the crucible event that he needs to, uh, what's the dragon he needs to slay? You know, how's he going to do that? What information is he going to gather along the way that's going to help him in his journey? So I'm thinking through all of these things, solving problems constantly on the written page. So that's really what I'm working through. It's not, it's not writer's block. It's not, uh, it's not ideas. It's not titles. It's, uh, it's really that, uh, that hero's journey and working through the problems that, that the protagonist has to deal with as he goes along in this journey. Do you think that following that hero's journey model uh, is uh, played out? Maybe it's not the right word, but do you see that ever getting tiresome for a reader or a viewer? Like, why is it that every story we resonate is that theme? And yet it doesn't seem like we've been exhausted on that theme, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's something in our DNA. It's something that uh, you know, from, the, from the first days when the first war party returned, uh, when the first hunting party returned um, to the cave, uh, there were these stories and these stories that, and those things were journeys. Um, and they wanted to take those journeys of the hunt uh, and of conflict and pass on certain lessons to the next generation. So they're passing along through, through sometimes stories that became myth, but they follow this journey. You're leaving. There's two. There's two stories in all of of, of literature. It's, it's that it's uh, a, a stranger goes to town, a man goes on a journey. Mm-hmm. Like everything fits those two narratives. Very right. basic, of course. Sure. But you think of think of the stories in terms of things that you liked uh, over the years. Stories you've been told, fairy tales, uh, literature, fiction, whatever it is, movies, TV shows, um, and typically they they fit a narrative that resonates with us. Uh, and I think it's go, it goes back to that oral tradition of storytelling around the campfire that uh, really rose up out of stories of the hunt and stories of the of going uh, on the warpath. Yeah, this, this makes sense. I'm just thinking about it in my own context. The, uh, the other day, my son, came, my oldest son uh, came to him and he was upset visibly. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, somebody called me fat. And we had, a, we had a, a serious discussion about that. I mean, my question was, well, do you think you're fat? And he says, yeah, kind of. I said, well, then you can do something about it. But you, you shouldn't let other people's words influence you that way. And, and what I did is I told him stories, a couple of different stories of when I was younger, when people would tease me for being overweight. Um, I, they used to call me a hermit because I, I would never really uh, be very social. I wouldn't go out and like hang out. And so I got the dub the title the hermit <laughs> so uh, but i, shared I like that. that yeah <laughs> but i shared these stories with him uh and then i told him you know here's how i overcame it and and now look you know, i'm not i'm not fat I'm, I'm not a hermit so you can change right and this is the this is the hero's journey that you're talking about yeah we're all on a journey we're all going to face adversity it's crazy and i think why these novels uh resonate with people uh movies resonate with people because uh you're you're going on a journey with someone you're seeing somebody that's facing adversity uh like i mean look at rocky underdog who's the mentor in that case that comes in with knowledge Mickey, yeah. you know, Mickey and, and, and Polo even, and yeah, and, and yeah, ha- and and he's reluctant at first. Remember, Rocky turns down; he doesn't want to do it at first. Yeah. So, I mean, they they fit this this uh, this narrative. But I love that story, and I love the hermit. I'm gonna have to steal that. Yeah, I love. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it down. Yeah. That's uh, that is awesome. I like that. If it uh, makes your way nickname. into one of your books, I just want to see my name somewhere. Somewhere. Oh, absolutely. I, I give a lot of credit <laughs> in those acknowledgments. You I, do, uh, man. You it's do. fun for me to. It's fun for me to do. But uh, you know, truth be told, I would love to be just up in the mountains, uh, oh, or hermit yeah. in a cabin, and not uh, not do all the the things that you, you need to do to uh, yeah. to build a business these days. I'm much more comfortable. And people think, you know, as a seal, how could you be introverted? Uh, you know, that's what. But it really, you know, I'm an introverted person. I learned not to over the years, just because I was a a natural leader from youth. Um, but you know, I was still very introverted, and I wanted to be thoughtful about things. Um, but that led to being um, a little more, I guess, reclusive or sure. shy or uh, hermit-like, quiet, I guess. Um, but, you know, I learned not to be um, as introverted, I guess, um, just to be able to communicate with people effectively, especially right. in special operations, both up and down the chain of command. But uh, but truth be told, I'd love to just be in the mountains in my cabin uh, with the family and send off uh, novels to New York and yeah. that's it. 
but uh, you can't really get away with that these yeah, days. A little different. <laughs> yeah. A little different in this environment. <laughs> I missed those days by, I don't know, 100 years or so. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, we yeah, were actually just right. you know, like Ernest Hemingway just uh, in the last night, in fact, we were thinking about that. You know, I think there's a misunderstanding of, of introversion as well. It's, it's not that an introvert is incapable or less qualified to be able to do those things. I think ultimately an introvert gains energy and renews his energy through uh, – through reflection and being alone and being focused on those other external factors than being around other individuals. So, cause I feel that way too. It's not that I'm incapable of presenting to audiences or that I'm uncomfortable uh, around a bunch of people. It's that I gain uh, energy and I'm recharged through taking a walk and being out in the wilderness and doing something that sounds like very similar to the things that you enjoy. Yeah, no, it's uh, like we say in the teams, it's get uh, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes, um, and that's uh, that's all that's all a part of it. But another piece of that is, you know, hundred years ago, fifty years ago, twenty years ago, uh, there wasn't a way for people to reach out and just tell you how they think. Uh, whatever your pursuit is, uh, they can comment on it, right? Uh, for better so, or worse, for, exactly. So you know, it's great. It's it's, a, it's engagement. That's wonderful. But it also means you know, I don't, you know, people also think seals have very thick skin, and uh, you know, you know, I'm human. <laughs> but course. I thought about this ahead of time, so I thought, okay, there are going to be bad reviews. Um, luckily, there are not that many. Like it's uh, when you go on and check out the reviews for the first two novels, there it's it's amazing, like how well it's doing. But there are some. It's not going to resonate with everyone. Luckily, it's resonated with so many people, and I'm so for it. Feel so fortunate um, for that. But uh, you know, there's a, and I do read the bad ones. But before I did that, I thought, okay, they're going to be bad ones, and you're going to you're not going to be able to just ignore them. You're going to you're going to look at them because you're a human. Yep. Uh, but I thought about it in terms of hey. If somebody takes the time to write something negative, well, one, it says a lot about them, but that's not the point of what I'm saying. The point is the things that they point out that they don't like are the exact reasons that someone else is going to like it. And so oh, it's 100%. going to make that sale for you. So someone says, oh, it's too violent or it's, it's uh, like perfect. You know, too much gear stuff. Or yeah, yeah, the guy's <laughs> like, oh, that's awesome. Or someone says, <laughs> you know, I didn't really, the gear, there's too much gear in there. And the gear guy's like, oh, I want to know what this guy uses or I want you to know what seals use downrange or whatever else. That's going to be great. So even the negative ones help. And uh, so I thought about it in those terms. And there was one funny one the other day. It's uh, it's near the top of the terminal list one on Amazon. And it's someone saying it was a one star. And luckily there's not many of those. But this guy said there was a contrived chapter in there where the author tries to humanize his protagonist and that uh, there's someone in a battle that he does not shoot. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. This contrived scene because that really happened. And that was oh, really me. Who, really? Who did not shoot this person going away from the battle in the Joff. And I, I changed it from the Joff to Fallujah in the, uh, you know, for the story. But uh, yeah, it was a two week campaign for taking a Joff in the summer of 2004. And I led a sniper team in there. Um, and it was, yeah, like, just like, kind of the movies of World War II that you watch when you're, they're taking cities. Like that's what it reminded me of. And uh, we pushed the Jay Shamati militia a couple blocks forward. They'd fall back towards the Imam Mali Mosque in Old Town Najaf. We'd go up, take snack positions, move in those Abrams tanks, move in those Bradleys. Um, the army logistics train would come in with all the water, all the food, more ammo. Because mm -hmm. the army logistics train, as you know, is, is uh, or probably, it's probably one of the best things we do as yeah. the military is that, is that logistics piece. Yeah. Um, and then, Bam, then we'd move forward, we'd come up with a plan, and then we'd move forward with all those different uh, 27 Cav and everybody else that was involved in that campaign. But uh, at this one stage, and, and the rules of engagement were, hey, this whole city is essentially, um, they're all bad guys. We've given them a couple weeks to get out of here. There's been leaflet drops, there have been announcements. Uh, Jay Shalmani is... Yeah. is and, and luckily they were mostly dressed kind of all in black, like they were kind of, which is unusual to have an, an enemy that had some sort of a uniform right. on. But, which uh, makes it so more we're, convenient, I'm sure. It, sure, it certainly does. Uh, but as we're taking this, uh, I was crossing this street and I took this corner and there was a guy, he was dressed in black and he was on a bicycle and he was just meandering down the street, just like, you know, you would if you're in a uh, kind of a beach town anywhere in the, the U.S. or maybe the Bahamas or something like that. And he's just... And I was just cruising along on a bike. And uh, I, had a, I, had an a, I think I had an ACOG on that because I switched up. We had all the different weapon systems we got with us because we could move them forward and have them brought forward with Bradleys and everything. So we had all the different sniper weapon systems and all the different yeah, M4 platforms and all that. So on this particular one, I had my ACOG and uh, you know had off safe 
and uh, had him in the scope, the little ACOG scope. I think it's a four power fixed, I think. And uh, and I didn't shoot. And I radioed back because we had all these, you know, different phases or whatever you call them as you're backed up towards the uh, the, the, the COP or whatever else um, with the leadership back there that's directing everything and kind of managing all the chaos. Um, so just let them know, hey, you got somebody coming back on a bike and uh, didn't didn't shoot him, although I could have. Um, and I talk about that being an important shot that I didn't take. And I would talk to my guys about that uh, in the future. And then I wove it into the storyline, fictionalized a little bit. I kind of combined two different events, but it was funny that someone in this review said this author contrived this thing, right. like, like almost like no one would ever do that. It's, <laughs> you know, and I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of funny. Cause that's, uh, that really happened. Yeah. Were you, were you aware enough at the time to, to really think about and process why you wouldn't shoot that individual? It just didn't seem, it just was something within me that was like, this is not someone you need to shoot today. Mm. Um, yeah, it kind of like reminded me, even though he's kind of fairly far off, you know, I forget exactly how far, let's say 100 yards or 150 maybe. Um, and uh, it just seemed like an old man on a bike. He happened to be dressed like the enemy, but he happened to also, like no one else was just meandering along in the middle of the street because sure. you're going to yeah. get shot. Right. Uh, so, and he was going away from the battle, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, it could be maneuvering, could be, you know, all those things, which is why I called back and got confirmation that they were going to pick him up you know, a couple blocks back. But, uh, yeah, just something was like, and I couldn't tell you what it was, but something was just like, this guy doesn't need to get shot today. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. Of course, <laughs> of course he could have been like a horrible terrorist, you know, that right. needed to go, maybe, but, yeah, uh, maybe. I don't know, maybe, but, uh, you know, had maybe, I shot him, I'd probably think- be telling myself that to sleep better at night. Yeah, well, I think there's this, and I talked with somebody on the podcast the other day about this, that there's this this sense that we have, and and you can call it intuition or the Holy Spirit or your conscience, whatever, whatever, you, whatever term you've dubbed it. But I really think that too many men aren't in tune with it, and they don't listen to it, and they talk themselves into or out of uh, some sort of contradicting uh, guidance from this intuition or Holy Spirit or again, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I, I firmly believe that there's, there's a sense that we just don't understand. And, and that's what it sounds like you were tapping into. Uh, and, and I think that the more you listen to it, the more prevalent it's going to become and the better choices you're going to make. It's just one more sense to take into consideration. Oh yeah. It's trust your instincts. And there's certainly something, uh, that is, we call a sixth sense and that, uh, that exists. And that sixth sense is the reason once again, that you and I are here today is because somebody in our past had a good one mm. and, uh, or the person they were following had a good one maybe. But, uh, that sixth sense has kept people alive, not just soldiers, um, uh, but people in general, uh, yeah. alive from the beginning of time to today. So listening to that, and it's still in us. Although as we are removed from the earth, we're removed from, do mo- for most of us, uh, are removed from the things that, that we need to do to provide for our families, protect our families. Um, and people are stumbling through life thinking that, uh, you know, to protect my family, what do I do? Well, I call 911. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to provide some food for tonight's dinner. What do I do? I go to the grocery store. Um, and, but it's in there. Even in those people, like it, even if it's a little innate, a little, uh, little covered up by all these, uh, and a very small, small portion of our existence as humans has been civilized. Yes. So the vast majority of our time on this planet was spent fighting and uh, providing food for our families. Um, so it's in there. It's even yeah. in those people that don't think they need to, to know how to defend their family, that don't think they need to, to know how to provide for their family, um, that they can just call a number or go to the grocery store or call Uber Eats even yeah. better and have yeah. it delivered. Right. Um, so, uh, but it's in there. That sixth sense is somewhere, but most people don't listen to it today. And that's when you get into trouble. It's a bit of a catch-22 because I, I imagine the reason that you joined or, or the reason, part of the reason that maybe you enlisted was that you you wanted to serve and you wanted to protect and you wanted to isolate these negative experiences somewhere other than your family and your friends and your community. And so you decided to go out and pursue this thing, right? Or you want to create in a different context, a better life for your children. And so you, you maybe coddle them a little bit more than you should, and you give them a little bit more ease and comfort than maybe they have earned or deserve. And so that's what we want to do as men. And yet, the other side of it is that sometimes we do those people a disservice by not allowing them to experience some of this hardship and challenge on their own because that's what makes them tough. So it really is an interesting uh, challenge and, and perspectives to consider that the, en- the ends of the spectrum, if you will. 
you have another couple of things there to unpack. And one is that that's why a mentor is so important, uh, particularly for a young person growing up, because, you know, a father figure is just that a father figure. And yes, the father figure can be a mentor or can have, you know, can do certain things that, uh, that would fall into that category, but it is also important. It's why we talk about mentors. It's why it's there uh, in literature from uh, uh, almost the beginning of the written word, uh, because there's that somebody who is not a family member, that uh, can say those things that maybe a father cannot, um, mm. or that uh, that a, that uh, it's, it's a different take, a different uh, uh, you know the perspectives are in line. Of course, have to be in line with uh, with the families, but someone that is not a family member that can take that young man out, uh, take them into the woods, um, teach them things. Maybe the father can. Maybe the father does not doesn't know how to shoot. Maybe doesn't know how to roll. Whatever 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 it is, fish. Um, but that can take that person out. And uh, and talk to them from that with that other perspective. So there's a reason they're in literature, and there's a reason they're in our lives, and why people that are in these positions, especially in business, like talk about mentors, people mm-hmm. that that uh, that did that for them as they progressed along the track. So um, there is that. And then for me, it was just a very natural thing to join the military. There was not there was never really another option in that uh, I knew what I wanted to do from such an early age. And a lot of that is probably because my grandfather was killed in World War II and he uh, was killed near the end of the war off Okinawa. He was a Marine pilot, Corsair pilot. Hmm. And uh, and so I grew up with his uh, the maps they used to give aviators back then, his wings, his medals, pictures of him in his plane. And uh, so I knew, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to step up and I'm going to uh, serve my country in uniform. And then, of course, growing up in the 80s, all, you know, one of my first memories is of Desert One and is of uh, the hostage hostage taking and those, uh, those black and white photos that came out. And then, of course, all the other things that happened uh, after that, so the, the embassy bombing in Beirut, the Marine barracks bombing in Beirut, uh, all the airline hijackings we had in the 80s. So all these things really happened at a time that uh, I was very uh, impressionable. I would say I knew where I was going to go. So I knew that going forward, this was my fight, even well before 9-11. Um, you know, th- this was going to be my fight. This was going to be my enemy. Um, and, uh, and I prepared myself for that from a very early age. I, I love it, man. I, I actually want to go back to, because now we're talking about your experiences and some of the things that you did. And a lot of this is interwoven into your, your novels that you put together, a, a, a healthy portion of it, which is great because it makes it more realistic. That's always, the, that's always a hard thing for me is you have uh, an author who's explaining something they know nothing about uh, or, or a musician who writes a story or, or sings a song about an experience that he's never had in his entire life. So I think there's a huge connection between what you've done in your life and what you put into your novels. But the question is, when you're creating characters, are you you, you using other people? Are you modeling what, what other people you know would do in that situation? I'm sure, you know, for example, there's probably a a healthy portion of, of James Reese is you, right? But then you have other characters who you probably don't resonate with personally and yet those people are critical to the story. Yep. No, exactly. And I so said, I'll talk with the protagonist first, James Reese. So I wanted to humanize him because a lot of times in the media, as you know, people uh, kind of put special operations people on a pedestal and treat them as uh, essentially superheroes, sure. invincible superheroes, although we know that they are not. Um, and really, you know, they, we are just people doing a job. That job happens to be special operations. That job happens to have dire consequences if you make a mistake. Um, and uh, so I, but I wanted the, the character to be human um, and his background to lend itself to what he was good at and then not so good at. So I wove in, you know, he's not so good at the surveillance stuff. Why? Because I didn't really do too much surveillance stuff, urban surveillance stuff. I did, you know, close target recce's and that sort of thing, but, uh, but not in the way that uh, the protagonist needs to do it in the story. And a lot of people think that, oh, all SEALs can pick locks and all SEALs can set up these, you know, elaborate surveillance things and listen in and do all get this. And so I wanted to make him human and uh, relatable um, and that he's good at some things, not at others. And uh, typically in these stories, you know, the guys, the protagonists like their coffee black and uh, you know, I like my coffee with uh, a little honey in it and uh, a <laughs> little bit of half and half. And so that's what I did. And I get, you know, I got a lot of, uh, a lot of heat about that in the, the military, liking a little, little foo-foo type coffee, especially in the Navy, you know, I get the old I chiefs bet. that, uh, just, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. uh, so, you know, I, I wove that in. Um, for other characters in the story, uh, a lot of them, even the bad ones, 
I just, I took some traits from people that I really like, mm-hmm. uh, but took one of their traits and threw it in there uh, for the bad guy to kind of, you know, make him not one dimensional um, and to make him different from the other bad guys in this. Um, so, uh, so I do, yes, most of the characters are based in part on people, uh, either singular or uh, plural that, uh, that I have known or run into. Uh, and some of them people that I never even met that I just, uh, have read about. Mm. I take certain parts of parts of those people and incorporate them. Cause I think we're all just, you know, what, what we are, are the combination of our experience, our knowledge, and what we, well, how do we turn the, that experience and that knowledge into wisdom? Um, and you know, what do we study along the way? Who are we? Uh, how do we deal with adversity? So all those different things and all the people that I've met along the way, they all lend themselves to somehow being incorporated in these novels because they're all a part of me somehow. Uh, so I learned, you know, all these characters come from somewhere and a lot of, yes, they're created, but they also have attributes of people I've either studied or people that I know both good and bad. Yeah. And it's fun. No, I bet. I, I bet it is. And I imagine this is why it resonates so well is because we can see ourselves. I mean, look, I, I think generally from a 30,000 foot view, I would say that I'm a, a good human being that I, that I'm a moral human being. I would say that about myself, but I also know that there's sides of me that maybe aren't as moral as you would think, or that I have an ability to go down maybe a dark side or a, or a side that isn't as virtuous as we like to portray on social media and some of these other outlets. Uh, we know that about ourselves. We don't let others know about it, but we know that about ourselves. And so when we see it in a character, I think it does make it more real knowing that, for example, our, our, our James Reese is, has, has this like revenge, maybe even hate filled drive in the first book, right? Which isn't a Captain America like quality. It's not a superhero quality. It's a human quality. And I think that makes it more relatable that you can sprinkle some of this stuff in. Right. So I, you know, I loved reading books about revenge growing up. I loved watching movies about revenge. There's a reason there's all these death wish movies. And it's because that resonates with us because when someone wrongs you in real life, whether it's taking your parking place or doing something underhanded in business or stealing an idea or whatever it is, um, and you are pissed, uh, and you have this cause once again, going back to uh, that, that DNA, like you want to do something about it. Uh, we have laws in place that keep us from doing things, but yeah. you know what? You can escape into the pages of a novel. You can sit down in a theater or you can click Netflix and you can watch it and you can watch someone else do it in a fictional way. Because if you do it in real life, you're going to jail. Yes. Uh, so well, you worse. cannot do a lot of these right. things in, uh, in real life. Sometimes, unfortunately, because I think people would be a lot more polite, uh, could you deal with things <laughs> in a, uh, a more primal way? But yes, so if you knew there was consequences for your, your mouth, for example, running your mouth. <laughs> or, or, yes, exactly. 100%. Exactly. Or taking a, a certain action. You know, yeah. you, nowadays people, you know, you know, you're probably not going to go out in the middle of the street and for the most part and, uh, you know, have a little showdown and, and uh, have things taken care of. But uh, but you can escape into the pages of a novel and you can enjoy that escape and go along on a journey with someone else who is doing the things that you can't do right. in real life. Yeah. So it's uh, that's kind of what I tapped into. And I, uh, I wrote down about five or six, seven, eight, someone different uh, one page executive summaries for possible novels as I was mm-hmm. kicking this off. And I chose the one that I thought would be the most visceral, the most primal, the most hard hitting, which would also be the one that would be most likely to get noticed by a publisher in sure. New York. So, so I looked at it in those terms. But uh, the one I really wanted to write, though, was the third one. And the third one is Savage Son. Right. And, uh, but I knew I couldn't start with it. Yeah, I could not start with that one, though. I needed the characters needed to get to a place where it would make sense mm. to, uh, to dive into Savage Son. But it was one of those original ideas that I wrote down as I started on this journey. So, um, and then what really differentiated it, I think, is pulling in those emotions, pulling in those feelings from real world events and applying them to a fictional narrative. Because if someone's reading it, uh, the emotions the protagonist is feeling, although, uh, I mean, they, they come from a real place. So they are real feelings just uh, attached to a fictional narrative. So I think that's what really uh, made this thing resonate and made it the success that it's, uh, that it's become. Yeah. Do you ever feel like you're or, or have been accused of encouraging people to act out some of their, some of these scenarios that you've created in your fictional work? Has that ever been brought up? Is that an issue that you're worried about or concerned about? What are your thoughts with that? 
No, I haven't been accused of that. And I think, you know, there's a uh, quite a resume from Hollywood and from other uh, authors that have, uh, you know, written things. Of course. That, uh, of course. <laughs> right? So I think I'm on fairly stable it just ground seems there. Like people are looking for reasons to be upset, they're looking for outlets to blame. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we, it, it seems to me we're seeing an uptrend in um, active shooter situations. And it just seems like, more and more people want to look for reasons that may not actually be there and pin them on uh, people in situations that have nothing to do with the, with, with the scenario we might be running across. Yeah, I guess people can look at uh, any sort of a, a story or whether it's fiction or non and take what they want from it um, and, uh, and, and turn it into what they want or need it to be to mm -hmm. justify whatever they're going to do. So that's a, that's a possibility, but, uh, no, I haven't yet. This is a, a fictional narrative and really what, what I talk about, uh, most often is this journey and mine happens to be writing. Mine happens to be publishing. Uh, that's my passion. And so I try to frame things in, in interviews, uh, as, Hey, this is, this is just, this is my journey. Uh, everyone's different. Uh, you're going to face adversity along the way. What really makes us who we are and reveals our characters, how we deal with that adversity. Uh, so I do talk about personal things. I don't name my kids or whatever, but I do sure. talk about them because it'd be unnatural for me not to, uh, talk about my family, where we live, that sort of thing. Um, but I really talk about try to put things in a positive way. And although some parts of the story are very dark, uh, all three novels. In fact, the third one, Savage Son, uh, really explores the dark side of man, where that first one was revenge. That yellow sticky was revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, that second one, the yellow sticky was redemption, a violent redemption. Uh, that third one that's coming out here in April is uh, the dark side of man. That's what, uh, that's what I'm exploring. Um, and I was inspired to do that by a novel, that, or not a novel, a short story that I read in sixth grade called The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell written in 1924. And what he really did was explore that hunter-hunted dynamic. And it was very different uh, way to explore that theme for the time. And really since then, a lot of the, uh, well, radio shows back then, uh, then movies, uh, books have all really, uh, had like, if you look at Die Hard, you look at all those sorts of things, Undersea, whatever, uh, you know, they have this theme of hunter versus hunted. Mm. And, uh, so he really influenced popular fiction, uh, in a way that resonated with me in sixth grade. And then I always knew that one day I would write a novel that kind of paid homage to his story and took it and m m applied his theme uh, to a modern day warrior. And so even in sixth grade, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the geopolitics of the day and how I was going to take that inspiration from what I read back then and, uh, and use it uh, going forward for a, for a modern day kind of incarnation of that, of that theme paying tribute to, to him. So, um, uh, so yeah, that was the, that was the third third theme that was on the yellow sticky yeah. I'm about to start the fourth one here pretty soon. So I'm getting, uh, it's all you outlined. So you're all done with, with number three, with Savage Sun. It's finished completely last weekend. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. I finished over the weekend and, uh, uh, I went to Russia to do some research uh, about a month ago. Yeah. And cause I wanted to, so the first, that second one, I went to Mozambique mm -hmm. and I really uh, did, kind of jumped into, Hey, what, what's the, what are the Chinese influences here? Uh, legal and illegal mining operations. Uh, is there meat poaching to feed all these workers? What's the ivory poaching like here? Uh, what are the effects of the, on the environment of what's going on? What are the politics? And really got to spend a lot of time with the professional hunters, uh, the trackers got a lot of the language down. Um, uh, as far as I wrote, I think I have the right behind me in the drawer here, but I had the 12 different pieces of paper with maybe 20, 15 or 20 different phrases I wanted to get in all these different languages so I could weave that in to the story. And so I want to do the same thing with, uh, with Savage Sun. So I went to Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia, just south of Siberia, Russian Far East. And it was interesting in that in Mozambique, everybody wanted to talk. Everybody wanted to tell the story of that country. What's really? going on with the environment? They all wanted to be part of this novel. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was amazing. Russia, different deal. A little different. And I thought it was going to be the same, but it was very different. And I think that's because for most of the history of that country, the modern history of that country, when you're getting asked questions by somebody, it's not a good thing. Uh, ever. Yeah. It doesn't matter who's asking you the questions, whether it's a naval or whether it's a government official, doesn't matter. Anybody that takes an interest and asks you questions, uh, so the radar goes up. Yeah. Very suspicious, and it's suspicious. not a good yeah. thing for most of Russian history to get asked questions. So I, I ran into that, and people were suspicious 
right off the bat, which was really interesting to me that I didn't anticipate, right? Because if I thought about it ahead of time, I probably would have uh, come to that conclusion, but yeah, I didn't. But you I was so busy. Known. Right. You wouldn't have known. I was known. Just so busy. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was very interesting. So I had to kind of pull this stuff out, you know, develop those relationships, develop that trust. Uh, but even so, even though they knew I was writing a fictional novel and the whole deal, they, uh, it was still a different dynamic than That's it was in, in Mozambique. But got some great stuff there and was able over the last couple of weeks to weave that into the fabric of the story because it was done before I left. But I knew I wanted that boots on the ground experience so I could add that, that authenticity to the novel. I could, hey, what kind of snowmobiles do they use around here? What kind of sleds? Mm -hmm. And, and they have some weird ones over there. They have yeah. a single ski in front instead of the dual. Oh, and yeah. that's because as they're going through this tundra or whatever, the dual... Uh, skis in the front ha are more apt to catch on something. They catch, so, right. Yeah, sure. so they have this single ski in front. It's crazy. So uh, so got some great stuff over there. I got to weave that into the novel. Cool. Uh, but I didn't bring a computer. I didn't bring a phone. I didn't bring anything because the third novel is really uh, Russia centric in that uh, it talks about Russian mafia. It talks about the Russian mafia relationship to the intelligence services over there. And I didn't want to get pulled into an interrogation room and uh, have them yeah. open my computer and go through this, even though it's fiction, uh, go through this with me for a little while. So did uh, you document it on, on paper? Like how did you document yeah. this stuff? Yeah. I had a notebook yeah. and uh, which, which is challenging because my writing is, uh, is part of my encryption that uh, it's very hard <laughs> to decipher. So, uh, so I have to now decipher all that and and this, uh, I, after we do this podcast, I'll be sitting down and transferring all those notes into Scrivener, which is a, a program that really helps you organize uh, your, your thoughts and your chapters uh, for, for writing a novel. So I'll outline it in Scrivener. So I'll have it all in uh, typed out in a way that makes sense. But yeah, the fourth one is, uh, is ready to go as far as a, uh, an outline. And now the next step us, is, uh, can you give us any hints there as, as, I think we'll just hint on Savage Sun. So, okay. uh, right. yeah. So fair enough, just, fair enough. Yeah. I got, I got to try, you know, I got to develop it a little more, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all, all outlined. And once again, I have a couple of those places where I'm like, Hmm, how am I going to solve this? Oh, I'll figure it out over right. you know, the next six, seven, eight months as I write. Uh, so I'm, I'm super fired up to, to dive in because I just I love it. Well, I can tell. I mean, I can tell you love it. I, I I've read I've read uh, Terminalist and True Believer, and looking forward to Savage Son. Um, yeah, you can tell you pour it into it, and uh, I really enjoy it. I don't read a whole lot of fiction. In fact, in fact, the last two fiction books I read were the two I just mentioned. Your two books. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank I appreciate, you. I appreciate all the work. That, oh, of course, man. I want to support you, and then not to mention, I enjoy the the entertainment. I enjoy the the dynamics and, and learning. And then of course, seeing all the research that goes into what you're doing. And I'm always fascinated by that. So, uh, any, any plans for, you know, hitting the, hitting the big screen or anything like that, that you can allude to. I, I don't know where we are with that or if that's something yeah. that's coming on board or not. Yeah. So unfortunately I still can't announce it, but, uh, and it could be derailing right now and I wouldn't know. Right. So I'm keeping my expectations very low. It's probably a good idea. Uh, so that, yeah. So that if it actually happens, I'll be pleasantly surprised. Yes. But, uh, as of right now, there's a, uh, yeah, date on the calendar to start filming. There's a, there's an really, actor, there's, a, there's a director, there's a screenwriter, uh, wow. there's financing. So, um, but of course I've heard of things derailing the first, well, half, a week into filming. Things Is that, that right? have Nobody derailed did. in Hollywood, yeah. Jeez. So it can always it can always go off the tracks. Um, but as of right now, it's uh, it's looking good, and I have to wait for the for them to announce it because that's much uh, much better. And I think that I'm hoping that announcement comes right around the time that Savage Sun comes out in April because the timing will be about right for them that to start uh, start yeah. filming a few months later. So uh, at least that's how it is on the calendar. So right. so we shall see. We shall see. Right on. Well, I'm excited for you. Um, it's been good to get to know you and, and develop a friendship. And then, of course, learn a little bit more about your craft and, and what you're doing is incredible. So ah, thank you. Thank you. And it goes both ways, man. I love following you and seeing what you're doing and that yeah. move to Maine. I can't wait to get out there. So we yeah, can we do this in get person. Soon. Yep. I've always wanted to go to Maine. I always wanted to hunt out there and uh, never made it up. And I thought got the we trail cams to... up right now. So nice. we're, we're tracking deer now. So Awesome, man. Yeah, I thought when we went to Virginia Beach, we had a SEAL team out there, yeah. um, that uh, that we'd be able to explore the East Coast, that I thought we'd be able to go down to like the Bahamas, because it's a lot closer to the East Coast than it is to that where I was in California before, and then go up to Maine, of course, and I thought we'd do like sea kayak up there and do all that. <laughs> And you know, no, no. We, 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 I don't think we ever left Virginia beach because that was <laughs> 2000. I got there in 2000. Three, early 2003 okay, and yeah. uh, immediately went to Afghanistan uh, right after that did went to Haiti uh, right after that went to Iraq then Iraq again so it was just like boom 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 and the whole rest of the time training so there was no time 
to go explore any of those places. So uh, I'm very excited to get to Maine, very excited to have an excuse to, to come out there and see you yeah. and see the family and sit down and do a podcast Absolutely. and uh, then and, and check it out because it's uh, what a beautiful state. It's amazing. And we'll get you out here in more favorable circumstances than the last time you were out here. So <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah. East coast. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Well, um, let me ask you a couple of questions as we wind things down. The first one is, what does it mean to be a man? Yeah, so it's that uh, being self-reliant, being able to provide for your family, being able to defend your family, and recognizing how important it is to raise good, productive citizens. So I think that really, for me anyway, encapsulates what it means to be a man. Right on. I love it. I love it and I agree. Uh, how do we connect with you, learn more about what you're up to, and, and pick up the books, of course, as well? Yeah. So, uh, official is the website and on there, there's a lot more deep dive into the gear in the novels, what I used in the seal teams, that sort of thing, uh, updates on book tours and all the rest of it. So that's all in there. There's a section on military insight that, uh, I just take little, little snippets of things I think about along the way, uh, leadership tactics, history, whatever it is, those are going up there, uh, about, about a lot of questions about a reading list. And before I left the military, the uh, uh, Naval Special Warfare Center asked me to put together a professional reading list. Hmm. Uh, so I did. I broke it down by sections. And, uh, and then I explained why each one of these sections was important for professional development. And I just turned it in. I have no idea if they ever incorporated it, any of it, all of it, whatever. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to start doing a uh, every month, pick six books, some from that, some from the fiction that I read well, throughout my whole life, uh, why it was influential to me, give a little explanation of like you know, where I was in my life when I read it, why I think it's important, uh, how it influenced me going forward. Um, so, so I'm going to kick that off soon. So just a little, little other ways to, uh, for people to, uh, to engage a little, learn a little bit more about, uh, what goes into the novels and really be transparent about the, uh, the process as people follow along on this journey and hopefully inspire a couple of people along the way to do whatever it is they want to do. Sure. Um, so officialjackcar.com is the website. And then on the socials, uh, I'm Jack Carr USA. So three, it was too many. So Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, and Twitter exist as far as Jack Carr USA, but on Facebook, it's a repost or whatever that's called from Instagram because they're enough. Yeah. Three was just too many. <laughs> and I really try lot, for sure. Oh man. So, uh, so there, so what I, I engage with people on Instagram and on Twitter and I try to get back to, to everyone because at this stage I can still do that yes. and I'm still, um, and I feel very fortunate and I feel, uh, so thankful that people read the novels that they've resonated with people and almost most importantly that they've then spread the word because word of mouth, is so powerful and it used to just be around the office cooler. Um, and now with everyone having a platform, that word of mouth is so powerful via social media that I, I, I really feel grateful to everybody that's uh, said they've enjoyed it and spread the words to their, their circle of influence. So I try to get back to everybody and say, thank you. Um, and if I miss you, it's just because I Twitter algorithm somehow, I just, right. I, quite, I have a blue check Mark now and it messed everything up. And now they're, <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to figure out sometimes, but, uh, but I try to get back to everybody on Instagram and, and Twitter and really engage with people on those platforms. Right on. Well, I appreciate your generosity with your time. Not, not just now, just in your friendship and, and what I see you do and how you interact with the community. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to them and just appreciate you and you taking some time today. Thanks brother. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And looking forward to doing this in person sometime. Absolutely.